So let's go into lecture two, which is basic microbiology. And the aim of this unit is to introduce you to essential facts about bacteria and their growth requirements. And the learning outcomes by the end of this unit, you will be able to explain in simple terms the nature of food poisoning bacteria and their effects on food, state and explain the four conditions necessary for the growth of food poisoning bacteria, state the temperatures of the temperature danger zone and recognize its importance in relation to food storage and give examples of high risk foods. So these learning outcomes uh, that I will mention before each unit, uh, these are the subject, if you like, of possible exam questions. So again, if you want to make notes as we go through the course, that's fine. Um, but I will mention um, the salient points uh, where I think they might come up as exams or exam questions. So uh, what effects do food poisoning bacteria have on food? What do you think? How do we know that the food poison bacteria are there? Do you think uh, there'd be a different smell, different taste, it'd look different? Well, actually, uh, food which is contaminated with food poison bacteria smells, looks, and tastes normal. So remember that, it's very important. Again, a question could come up. How do we know that food poison bacteria are on or in food? Well, we don't, uh, because everything looks and smells normal. There is another group of bacteria which does affect food and leaves smells and colours, etc. different. And they are called spoilage bacteria. So there we are. We've got two different types of bacteria at the moment. We've got food poison bacteria. These are the ones that make you ill, could kill you. Uh, but it uh, doesn't affect the smell, look and uh, taste of food. Then you've got spoilage bacteria which do affect the taste, colour, smell and texture of food. But these won't hurt you. Uh, spoilage bacteria won't cause food poisoning. So let's have a look at the signs of food spoilage bacteria. First of all, off odours. Uh, obviously there's a different smell to the food than there should be. Discoloration. Uh, you might have seen sometimes you'll go into Asda's or Tesco's or other supermarkets are available. Um, you'll see on the meat counter in the pre-packaged meat uh, where it's coming up to the uh, use-by date that the colour is starting to change. Um, the lamb is starting to look a bit green and the beef is starting to look a bit black. Uh, this is because of the spoilage bacteria is causing the discoloration. You've also got slime or stickiness, uh, uh, again affected by food spoilage bacteria. You've got mould growth. Texture change, which could become more spongy as the uh, yeasts or other spoilage bacteria start to work within the food causing pockets of gas. You've got an unusual taste. The production of gas uh, normally uh, or could be hydrogen or carbon dioxide gas depending where the gas uh, is uh, situated. And blown cans or packs. Uh, this is where there's a gas buildup in cans of food or packs of food, even like a bag of the box wine for example. I've seen examples where it looks like a big football because of a buildup of carbon dioxide gas because the yeasts have not been destroyed by the addition of sulfides, uh, which they should add uh, in order to kill the yeast. And blown cans, again, could be a buildup of carbon dioxide, or sometimes could be a buildup of hydrogen gas. And damaged packaging is another sign of food spoilage bacteria. So let's have a look at bacteria. What are bacteria? Well, they're living creatures, they're animals, they're single-celled organisms. So bacteria, first of all, are microscopic. You can't see them in the human eye. You need a microscope. Uh, they differ a lot from us because of size. I say they differ a lot from us. They're very similar to us as well because the genetic material, the DNA, uh, is very similar to a human and other animals. Now, they are found everywhere, the ubiquitous, but there are four main places I want you to remember, and that is raw meat, sewage, water, and soil. The main depository for bacteria on the planet is soil, so that's where you'll find the most bacteria, followed by water, because obviously two-thirds of the planet is covered in water, and you'll find bacteria in the sediment mainly, but also in the liquid element. Um, not just in sea, but in fresh water as well. And in raw meat, 
Uh, I mentioned earlier that all, f all raw meat contains food, poison, bacteria. Don't forget that. And sewage. Sewage is a big problem because it contains a host of various uh, diseases, disorders, infections, and parasites and fungal diseases, etc. Um, sewage is uh, really the waste material from humans and other animals. And with us, when we expel uh, our feces, uh, it's not that dangerous until the bacteria that's present in the feces actually mutates with the environmental viruses and bacteria and causes um, infectious diseases to be within the sewage. And uh, raw meat, uh, again, when in abattoirs they uh, take the animals and they get them to remove all the internal organs, blood, uh, etc. Uh, there's a lot of splashes and spillages from the internal uh, colon, which again will contain diseases within the feces, and that is spread to other parts of the meat as well. Other names for bacteria include pathogenic bacteria, microorganisms, pathogens, germs and microbes. Now anything with the word micro in means it's microscopic. Any word uh, that contains patho means they cause illness. And a question which could come up is what is a pathogen? And the answer is it's a, a bacteria or they are bacteria that cause illness and as we know can uh, possibly kill. So pathic bacteria uh, they're the bad ones. You've got pathogens, the bad ones. We've grown up with the word germs, uh, which we tend to think are the uh, bad bacteria. But the other ones, you've got microorganisms and microbes, they relate to all bacteria, good and bad. So, are all bacteria harmful? Uh, you might say yes, because I've only talked about pathogens. I have mentioned spoilage bacteria, but they are not harmful. Well, there are three types of bacteria. There's the good, the bad, and the ugly. Now, I don't know if this will work on here. Obviously not. Um, normally, the good, bad, and the ugly theme music comes up. Uh, but it's not for some reason. Uh, so the good bacteria, um, we've used to make beer, cheese, yogurt, etc. Uh, so different types of bacteria are added to foods in order to increase their taste or long longevity in um, relation to how long they last. Then you've got the bad, which are the pathogenic, they cause illness. And you've got the ugly ones, which are the spoilage, which cause food to perish or rot. So the three types of bacteria, remember those, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So let's have a look at some food poisoning bacteria. Uh, again, you don't have to remember these words um, or have to spell them for the exam. Uh, you did have to a few years ago, but they've taken this part of the curriculum. Right? But it's worth knowing about them anyway. Uh, you've got salmonella, uh, again, a big cause of uh, diseases uh, with food poisoning. There are about two and a half thousand different types of salmonella. Um, S several of them are called after the name where or the place where they were discovered. Salmonella Cardiff, for example. Then we got two types of Clostridia: Clostridium perfringens, Clostridium botulinum. Uh, Clostridium botulinum is uh, quite bad in as much as it produces the world's uh, worst toxin. Uh, it's a neurotoxin, and if that gets into your body, it can kill you within two minutes. Uh, they also use that poison, strangely enough, the botulinum toxin in Botox, uh, used to stretch people's faces to make them look younger. Next one is Bacillus cereus. Uh, this is the rice bacteria, causes food poisoning in rice that's been cooked and left out in uh, a warm atmosphere rather than being chilled if it's going to be used cold, or a rice that's not being reheated properly. Uh, what happens, there's things called toxins, which we'll look at later on, comes from the bacteria and it poisons the rice and that what causes food poisoning. And the last one there, a bit of a mouthful, Staphylococcus aureus, 
This is the bacteria that was present on all humans and other animals. It's on our skin, it's in our nose, it's in our eyes. It's bacteria that prevents us from contracting other infections. It actually uh, protects us uh, from other environmental bacteria. Um, there must have been some sort of deal struck up uh, many millions of years ago between this bacteria and uh, the animals that were in existence at that time. Um, and it's called a symbiotic relationship where uh, we let the bacteria live on us um, and they're quite happy where they are. They can feast on our sweat and because they're salt tolerant, uh, they've got plenty of moisture to live there. Uh, they live on environmental uh, nutrients, but they also protect us from infection. So there's that symbiotic relationship going on. Uh, requirements of bacterial multiplication. Well, it's bacteria very much like us. They need certain things in order to grow or multiply. And I'll explain what multiplication is later on. They need food, moisture, warmth and time. So it's a bit like a jigsaw. If you've got all the four elements of the jigsaw coming together, you will get bacteria growing and then eventually causing food poisoning. So let's have a look at the different food types. Uh, you've got high-risk foods. These are common vehicles in food poisoning, usually made of protein, ready to eat, stored in your refrigeration, and no further processing required. So again, these are the sort of foods you'd find in a, in a deli or a supermarket fridge, such as you've got cooked ham, uh, you might have some cakes, uh, cold prawns, you might have a pork pie, for example, some pâtés, uh, anything that contains protein and is usually kept in a fridge. The other type of food is raw foods and they're the major source of food poisoning organisms. So that's where we find the food poison organisms in raw foods. It's when they are transferred to high risk food or what we call cross contamination that they become a problem. They don't particularly like uh, raw food. Um, there's not a lot of nutrients in there. They prefer like we do cooked food. So if they can get into cooked food, they'll multiply rapidly, especially at the right conditions. Other food types, low risk foods, uh, which have never been implicated in food poison outbreaks. Um, that's normally because they're acid foods uh, with a pH of below 4.5. They've got a high sugar, or salt or fat content. They're dry products. They include preserved foods not requiring refrigeration and anything else in ambient storage or room temperature. And ready to eat raw foods. So you're talking about salads and fruit. Ready to eat raw foods uh, should be thoroughly washed before consumption to minimize the risk from low dose pathogens. Now low dose means you don't need many of them to make you ill. Normally with food poisoning bacteria, you need uh, several hundred thousand or million or more to make you ill. Um, as an indication in size, you can fit a million salmonella on a pinhead. So normally you need a pinhead's worth of bacteria, a million to make you ill, but with um, ready to eat raw foods, because they, a lot of them are grown in soil or they're handled by people um, with uh, not much idea about food hygiene, um, you will get the low dose pathogens where you just need one or two bacteria to cause a problem. Uh, another one, let's look at this germometer. Now you will need to know about these temperatures, so it's worth writing them down. Um, I've got a thermometer showing a freezing point, which is minus 18 degrees up to boiling point, which is 100 degrees C. Now, at minus 18 degrees C, freezer temperature, bacteria will survive. They won't die by freezing them. They will go into hibernation. Um, so if you defrost um, an item of raw meat, it will still contain the pathogens. No degrees C. Then we go to refrigeration temperature, which is one to four degrees C. Then we enter what we call the temperature danger zone. It starts at 5 degrees C up to 63 degrees C. Now anything uh, kept, any high-risk food, for example, kept in the danger zone is got a good potential to have bacteria grow to large numbers. And the ideal temperature for growth of bacteria is 37 degrees C. Anything lower than that is a bit too cold for bacteria. 
once you go to five degrees C to sound, it's a, a bit cold for them. They started to wake up. They started to multiply slowly around about 20 and 30, but 37 is the ideal temperature. Anything above 37, it's too hot for them. They'll stop multiplying. Uh, they start dying around about 50, 55. But certainly by the time you get to 63, they're all dead. But one of the temperatures uh, which we are told by Environmental Health under the Food Standards Agency to cook our food to is 75 degrees C. So for the sake of this course and exam, that's the temperature to cook it to. But certainly if you cook food to 60 or 63, it's still quite safe because all the bacteria are killed and you'll get a much succulent uh, food uh, by cooking it to a lesser temperature than 75. There's also the two hour hot rule and the four hour cold rule. Uh, now what that means is, uh, let's take the first one, a two hour hot rule. Uh, all food by law, uh, if you're going to serve it hot, say like on a carry, it's got to be held at 63 degrees C or above. Now if the food uh, goes down in temperature, for whatever reason, the equipment might break down, <coughs> excuse me, uh, below 63, then you've got two hours to actually sell that food. Or you can actually cool it down, chill it, and use it the next day um, as a chill product, but not reheating it. The four-hour cold rule um, is, in my view, a bit more of a dangerous rule. What it means is, say, for example, you've got some sandwiches or high-risk food in a chiller cabinet between 1 and 4 degrees C, and the chiller breaks down, all of a sudden, the food inside starts to um, go up in temperature. You've got four hours to actually sell that food. The thing is, within four hours, bacteria can multiply quite substantially. So again, you've got, say, sandwiches. You take them out into ambient temperature. At the end of the four hours, they must all be sold. 90-minute cool down. Another thing to remember, uh, if you take meat, for example, out of an oven, you are allowed to let it rest uh, in a cool place in a kitchen for no more than 90 minutes before you refrigerate it. Uh, this is an example of a digital temperature probe. Uh, it gives an accurate reading of the internal temperature of the food product. And by the food product, I mean meat uh, generally. Uh, we're not too worried about vegetables. Vegetables are not a major source of food poison, but certainly meats are. So we're looking for an internal temperature of 75, as per the FSA. Or if you want a more succulent joint, like with chicken, uh, beef, or anything like that, uh, around about 63 degrees Celsius would be fine. And it'll give uh, a more juicy end result. Frozen storage. Always ensure you wrap food in a freezer to prevent contamination. Freezer burn. And it must be stored at what temperature? Have a think before I put up the right answer of minus 18 degrees C. Frozen storage, always make sure you clean and defrost your freezers thoroughly. Cover and label food, keep food tidy. Don't overstock, don't put any warm food in. And always adhere to the little acronym FIFO, which stands for first in, first out. Um, it's a good method of stock control um, and to make sure that everything is used within date. So all the old stuff, uh, when, when you've got new stock coming in, the new stock goes to the back of the fridge or freezer, for example, and the older stock comes forward. Chill storage uh, fridges should be at what temperature? The answer is 1 to 4 degrees C. Now, chilled storage, again, very much like freezers, always clean and defrost your fridges thoroughly, cover and label food, keep food tidy, don't overstock, first in, first out, don't put any warm food in there, separate raw and ready-to-eat foods, and decant food from metal containers. So if you've opened a large tin of uh, beans or meat, um, always put that into um, a food safe container such as like a tupperware container uh, don't leave them in the original metal container because you will get metal contamination and going back to the separate raw and ready to eat foods um, 
A question that'll come up is where would you put salads into a fridge? Let's say you know you've got salads, you've got raw meat, and you've got cooked meat or sandwiches, Irish food. Where would you put the uh, three elements? Well, the answer is you always put raw meat, raw products, at the bottom of the fridge. You would put salad items in the middle of the fridge, above the raw meat, and you put high-risk foods such as sandwiches, uh, cooked meats, etc., on the top shelf of the fridge. So that's the correct position. And with children and frozen delivery, uh, if you're responsible for accepting delivery of children frozen food, if foods are delivered above accepted temperatures, they must be rejected. Because now this is part of the food safety chain, the first link, if you like, after it comes from the supplier. So you've got to check the temperature of chilled food it must be between 1 and 4. Frozen foods must be minus 18 or lower. If they're above that temperature, send them back. And when you're thawing food, check to ensure that food is probably thawed before cooking. Uh, there, there has been times in the past where I said, yeah, you look for pliable uh, leg joints. If it's um, chicken, for example, make sure there's no ice in the cavity. The best way to ensure that food is probably thawed before cooking is with a temperature probe. And again, with the temperature probe, always ensure you sanitize the, uh, the pointy bit, if you like, the probe itself, with a sanitizer before you, or even boiling water is a good uh, uh, environmentally friendly sanitizer or disinfectant. Insert that into the chicken in several parts, including the cavity, and as long as there's no minor signs on there, uh, you're ready to go. Although you can cook anything from frozen, there were some demonstrations and studies shown in the States going back in the 70s where you could cook a, a, a 16 pound turkey from frozen. That's fine, um, but you've got to remember that the core temperature must be above 63 degrees Celsius or 75 as per the FSA. Uh, the only problem is with cooking large joints from frozen is that by the time the internal temperature gets to that correct temperature, the outside becomes sort of dry and burnt. And cooking, uh, always ensure food is cooked thoroughly, and it shows there the chef cook, uh, actually checking the temperature, is shown 86.2, so it's well above 75, so that's ready. Always check that food is cooked thoroughly, to what temperature? For the sake of the exam, 75 degrees C. When you reheat a food, only reheat it once, to a minimum temperature of 75 degrees C, so the same as the cooking temperature. So this might have been a uh, steak and kidney pie that uh, you were serving yesterday on a carvery. You keep it above 63. Um, you had one portion left over, so you've chilled it down. You've taken it out the next day. You've reheated it uh, in the microwave, perhaps, or uh, a regeneration oven. And you regenerate it to an internal core temperature of 75. Hot holding. Now, when you're keeping food hot, for example, here you've got what we call a bain-marie. You've got uh, gantry lights. These are infrared lights, which, uh, which gives a top heat. And these trays are kept on a heater. Uh, it can be dry or a wet heater, which keeps it hot from underneath. And the hot holding temperature should be at or above what? The answer is 63 degrees Celsius. Um, binary fission. Uh, now you might not get a question on this in the exam, but you will get one on the revision tests. Binary fission means literally doubling in size. Um, under ideal conditions of food, moisture, warmth and time, pathogens and other bacteria, other good bacteria, will multiply every 10 to 20 minutes. Um, remember that for the exam though, um, is that bacteria will double in size now they might ask you, um, or the one of the potential answers could be 10 to 20 minutes or just 10 minutes. Whichever it is, with the one with the 10 minutes in, that's the right answer. So it'll double in size after 10 minutes. And binary fission really is just the term for how bacteria grow or how they multiply. Uh, so just showing you this, uh, bacteria double in size. You see that double in size every 10 minutes. 
So to give you uh, an example of multiplication, if you had one bacterial cell double in size under ideal conditions from one, at uh, say um, minute one or minute naught, after six hours, one bacteria or bacterial cell would have multiplied to six billion bacteria. Don't forget, you only need about a million or half a million to make you well. So it can happen quite quickly. Now, let's have a look at something called spores. Again, a question will come up with this. Spores are a resistant resting phase for certain bacteria. Uh, certain bacteria, there are only two families of bacteria, which you don't need to know which ones they are. Um, when the going gets tough, they go into hibernation. They turn themselves into a spore. Think of it like a dried, protected seed, like an M&M &M with a crusty shell on the outside. On the inside, the bacteria will stay dormant. It's called a resistant resting phase. Uh, spores, not bacteria, but spores can survive high temperatures in excess of 2,500 degrees C. They can survive chemicals such as sanitizers and disinfectants. And they can survive dehydration. So you can find spores in uh, soil and dry conditions lasting many thousands of years. So unsuitable conditions for a bacterial cell. What happens is the bacterial cell will form a spore inside itself. The rest of the cell will disintegrate, which will leave us with a spore. And the spore is harmless in its state, uh, in the state of being a spore. Um, it's only when the spore vegetates or germinates that it becomes dangerous again because what's happening is growing back into a bacterial cell uh, which then will multiply into more bacterial cells. So remember that spores won't hurt you. In fact, we ingest spores on a daily basis. They don't germinate inside us because our stomach is very acidic and it'll stop the process of germination. But certainly, if they're given ideal conditions, uh, moisture, uh, they'll germinate and they'll start to grow if they've got nutrients as well, food. And lastly, for this slide, toxins. So toxins are, if you like, animal poisons. Because what happens is, uh, with a toxin, certain animals, um, such as snakes, for example, uh, some snakes produce venom, like a viper or a rattlesnake. Uh, that venom is a toxin. So toxins are poisons produced by a uh, living creature. Certain plants will produce toxins, like the strychnos tree will produce strychnine. Um, it's a way of protecting itself from attack and predators. And bacteria, some bacteria will produce toxins as well. They produce two types. They produce an exotoxin. Um, when This is when bacteria grow in food. For example, Staphylococcus aureus, our bacteria, if we cough or sneeze over food, uh, then the bacteria under ideal conditions will grow on the food, and as they grow, they release toxin. Same as us, when we eat food, we give off um, feces and urine, it's our waste material, to the bacteria, it's their waste material also. But the toxins are poisonous to us. Um, you also get something called endotoxin. This is where bacteria uh, go into our gut, uh, for example salmonella, and where the bacteria die because perhaps there's not enough nutrients about, or there's not enough moisture, or in fact our uh, immune system is attacking the cells, then when the uh, material breaks down, for example there and there, toxins are released from the cell itself. So that pain uh, we get, uh, that uh, abdominal pain, is due to the immune system attacking the cells and inadvertently releasing toxins from the bacterial cells. Okay, so next is revision test for unit two. So again, click on the link below, um, try the questions. Uh, there are 10 in uh, this uh, unit.